every day of my life for the last almost three years, but seven really, but every day for three years, and we just released it. The second episode airs tonight. That's fantastic. Well, I thought we would watch the trailer uh, while we have you here. We'll watch the trailer oh, okay, cool. in a minute here, and you can kind of walk us through like how, how a show like that comes together. Um, but while we, we've just seen Empire of Dirt, I, I want to um, throw the, the microphone open to the class and see if anybody has a question that came to mind as we were watching the movie that you want to jump in. I have lots of stuff prepared. So I want this to be a kind of uh, class run opportunity if anybody wants to get us started. Just raise your hand, I'll give you the microphone. Ah, great, we have a question over here, hold on. <laughs> um, what's been your favorite thing that you've been a part of while working on stuff? Oh my goodness. Um, I have, there are so many favorite things. I've, I've really been very lucky to do so many things. I work in front of the camera, I work behind the camera. So it's hard to pick. Um, my funnest, my most funnest thing was working on a film as an actor called Bogus by Norman Jewison. I got to train with the Cirque du Soleil for like, I don't know, three weeks as a clown, and I did like crazy circus tricks. It was the best experience of my performing career, and then went to the premiere and was totally cut out of the movie, because apparently on the test on the test screenings it scared kids. So best experience to make it, like worst experience to watch it. But there's, there's lots, I mean, as one day you will all probably have, have a similar experience where, I don't know if they, are all of you filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers, writers, directors? I don't really even know who I'm speaking to. Yeah, it's about half and half. So we've got, uh, this is a history of motion pictures class. We're at uh, roughly the sophomore level of college. And about half the class, maybe a little bit more than half the class are majoring in cinema studies. So they're okay. interested in filmmaking and film history probably more than making more history, to be honest. Yeah. And then about half the class are um, general University of Oregon students who are taking this as, for a graduation requirement. Oh, okay. Like an arts and uh, class. So then in that context, I would say um, my, favorite, my favorite thing in terms of making something as a filmmaker um, it probably was Empire of Dirt because of how challenging it was. And I think one of the most um, incredible uh, expressions of a storyteller is our ability to overcome obstacles and be really like creative thinkers to essentially like break through all barriers with a, a creative solution. And that movie was like compounded by problems and barriers, um, financial and otherwise. So I would say in terms of like filmmaking experience, that is definitely one of my favorites because of how everything came together, how I fought to get that movie back and found the money myself and made it for $350,000 and did it in 15 days and starred in it and never wore a stitch of makeup, never had to go to hair and makeup. Like there's just so many reasons why it was my favorite. We go again. So um, while we're still talking about the, the film itself, I think in the, the interview that you gave with your sister Sarah for the Berry Film Festival uh, that you sent me, that uh, you said, I think you said that it was eight years in the making just to, to yeah. get the film made, and then here we are ten years later, um, and I discovered it on Tubi. Um, so may, uh, this would be a great kind of case study, and maybe you could walk us through, like, I don't think everybody realizes the work of producing a film, right? The think of it being, just being on set, you get to work with cool people, and then boom, it's over, and the movie, you move on to the next thing. So do you mind walking us through a little bit, like that process of how something like this gets started as a concept, gets stuck, gets unstuck, how you find money, and then, and then get it 
even through production to the other side to getting it seen by people? Yeah, well, I could give like a, a, a very sort of high level overview step by step, but I want to remind everyone that things are different in Canada. Our funding system is different. The way our studio system works is very different. So it might not be as relevant in terms of the money piece, but here in Canada, producers are, um, which is very different because when I go to LA and I'm like, you know, selling shows and, you know, pitching and stuff, uh, I'm talking to production companies that are studios. Whereas in Canada, we don't have studios, but production companies like my production company or any other producer out there has a production company and we are the people who make the content. And we, you know, work with broadcasters and networks. We have a much smaller, I guess, um, infrastructure. <clears throat> so it works a little bit differently. So in terms of Empire of Dirt, it's a good example of like a film that was written specifically, you know, to for me to produce. I was brought on early by the filmmaker, by the writer, Shannon. Um, she brought me on to make the movie, and at the time I had only made television and didn't really know how to fundraise for a feature film. But um, it was, so the first barrier was that it was an indigenous lead character. That was the first major barrier because at the time, like nobody was interested in, in nobody was interested in indigenous stories and nobody was interested in indigenous lead characters. Um, many people, like I took, we got into Tribeca All Access at the time and like pitched it to, I don't know, 20 different production companies and studios. And everyone was just like, can you change the lead character to a white person and then make the secondary character an indigenous person? That was like our first barrier. Um, and then it sort of just continued like that. It was very hard to, um, I wanted either myself to direct it, because at the time I had already directed a bunch of stuff. Um, and then, you know, we got into a program at a place called the Canadian Film Center. Again, Norman Jewison, filmmaker, director, well known in the States, I'm sure. Um, he has a, a film center up here where he like incubates filmmakers. So it got in there into one of their like feature film incubators, which essentially like takes it through through a writing process, and then you get I don't know a bunch of money, like eight hundred thousand dollars to make the movie. But I felt um, very much like very stifled in that system, and I didn't feel good in my gut about making the movie there with their structure. So I took it back and I had to raise the money myself. Um, and I think pr what people don't realize is that producers don't have money, they raise money. And raising money is really just about like all of the relationships that you've built over time. And I think that's the most important thing, even in the States, I think anywhere in the world is, it is whether you're a writer, director, filmmaker, storyteller of any kind, it's all, the, it's all about relationships. You know, and then it's the the sustainability in the career w relies on your ability, on your talent, on your you know grounded perspective as a storyteller or you know director, writer. Um, but the relationships are really the most important thing, and those are the things that you rely on once you're you know if there are any producers in the room who are you know making their own content the relationships are the thing that will get you in the door. So ultimately with Empire of Dirt, I, I managed to put together some money, not a lot of money because it was very hard to sell a movie with three indigenous women, um, with three indigenous women, there weren't really any other characters. Um, so I ended up putting together $350,000. Um, my friend, you probably know Sarah Polly. I don't know if you guys study Sarah Polly's work, but she's, been a good friend of mine and supporter for a long time and at the time she said why don't you just take this movie to to Mongrel Media app it, their distributor up here and you know you get this minimum guarantee to give you a bunch of money and in my case it was seventy five thousand dollars but essentially it goes you, you borrow it against your sales so I was thinking like 
they're not gonna want this movie. Like, they're a big distributor. So anyway, I took her advice. She made the introduction. I took it to Mongrel, and they filled my financing gap, like my $75,000 financing gap, and I ended up making the movie for $350,000. And in order to do that, um, I only had 15 days and a very, very small crew. So the other part of the legacy of the film was when we were at the Canadian Film Centre, I wanted to direct, they said no. I brought a couple of other Indigenous directors. Like I really thought at the time this could be like the first big, like all Indigenous movie. Producer, studio, my studio. And when I say studio, I mean like, like a business card that says Red Cloud Studios because there is no actual studio. Um, well, there is now, but it's very small. Anyway, um, but they wouldn't, we, they wouldn't, they didn't want that. So at the time, they said, you know, you need, in order to do a movie with us, you need to have a director with a track record. And at the time, there was no Indigenous director in the States or Canada with a movie that had done well in the theaters. So I was up against that. Um, so I asked my friend Peter Stebbings, who had a, done a movie with Woody Harrelson called Fendor, and it was really good. I love Peter. I've known him, you know, for a long, long time. He's a dear friend. I love his visual storytelling. I love him as a director. He's very gentle. He grew up with women. He was like the only person that I really trusted with this story. And he had a successful movie, a deal with Sony. He was like the guy. So I basically asked him to do it. He did it for free. Um, very much against his agent's wishes and all his Hollywood people, but he did it for free. So that's how I made the movie. It was very, it was critically acclaimed. We won all the awards, you know, first Indigenous woman screenplay. I, I was nominated for um, best film. Like we, we really were a critical success, um, but never made a penny. <laughs> Not one penny on that movie. But it's, it, it was a good, it was a really good, new movie to make. Um, it was important, it did break down barriers, and it taught me a lot about, um, about my own ability to overcome some of the more difficult realities in this business that have nothing to do with storytelling and art and creativity and yeah, all of those things that are, you know, essentially that motivation. It has, the, the things that I learned on that film were so beyond that. Um, and I'm very grateful. That was a really long answer. Oh, that, was, that was incredible. I mean, the, the answer kind of, it needs to be long, right? To, to, because the process is so deep and there's so many factors. Um, and uh, well, well I, and are there other questions from, from the class? Uh, I'll bring the mic around. I'm way back here, and I'm going to move over to the, this side of the room. There are a couple questions over here. You're a little closer, so you get to go first. Um, so within the film, I noticed that a lot of the information that we find out about each character is done more through showing rather than telling. Um, so I, I was just wondering, I feel like it's so easy to blatantly like let out characteristics and past events that characters go through. So I was wondering if there was any struggle or method that you had within trying to display a story, um, not just like plain and simple. Yeah, I think, I think for that specific story, we wanted it to be very, uh, like very grounded and realistic in terms of uh, showing people who have, who carry a burden of the past um, and were able to sort of overcome their past traumas and, you know, fractured relationships uh, and, and to, to sort of feel it rather than show it. And that was just really important for that specific story, um, especially because it was multi-generational. You don't want to have to really go and tell everybody's story. So, I mean, I hope that's what we did. I think every time, you know, you come to a story, you have the, a choice of how, of how to 
how to tell it. There are so many different devices, and you know, depending on depending on the tone you set for your storytelling, that will kind of guide you into you know how to stay how to stay on the path and how to stay sort of in the lane of that tone. So that specific story for me was very grounded reality and you know even the way how how I really wanted the camera to feel like really natural and um, you know handheld but not shaky but like but real and breathing all the time and you know to have to have this I, this feeling that we were like with people that was very intentional and it has to align very much with the decisions of the directorial decisions it has to align with every other creative decision you make but you can also you know choose to do something that's a you know surreal or psychological or you know whatever tone you choose and then that's how your story your your storytelling will be filtered through you know the tone that you choose so it was very intentional in that film to do it that way Toward the end of the film, there's some wonderful shots of like ripples uh, and sunspots that appear uh, when the when the characters are at the lake, um, and then with, with close to the end where uh, where the main character Lena sees the wolf and stops, and then we have that sudden kind of arresting car accident um, that add a, a, another dimension as well to the to the realism. With a, another question up here, and then we'll watch the trailer for Little Bird and talk a little bit more about uh, what you're doing now and how your career is show and all that kind of stuff. Hello. Um, I just have a real quick question. I'm curious as to how somebody at, like, say, this level, like the student level, um, can make films and make, like, a jump from doing it for, you know, like, we got 20 bucks per person or something like that to pass around and go around to you know, making movies that have an actual production budget, working with studios and other, you know, experienced people within the industry. I think that's something that's just really difficult for a lot of people to get to. And I'm curious to hear, like, your story, how you got there. Well, I think the model still stands that, you know, the most interesting films and the most interesting storytellers and filmmakers are, you know, the younger generation who, are doing really innovative things and getting their films into festivals. There's nothing wrong with doing films for no money. Like some of the most, you know, remarkable films that you'll see are are done for for nothing. And I think that's where you really stretch your ability as a storyteller. I don't think you need money, but I also I also think that today you're able to kind of harness technology in a way that I was never able to because it was very expensive when I was, you know, younger until di until the onset of digital, you know, technology and, and the way we can tell stories now, um, until that time came about, it was it was very expensive. But I do believe that today you can be very innovative and tell stories and show your very unique perspective. That's that's what people want. They want to see a unique perspective and something that is is special that only that specific person can execute. You know, don't try to be like anybody else. Have your own voice and execute that voice. If you're a director with no interest in producing, find someone in your class or in your group or in your community who is interested in producing because they're the ones who are going to, you know, hustle so hard because they love your film and they, you know, think they believe in you and your project and they believe that you can, you know, rise together and they will hustle so hard for you to get private financing, to get locations for free, to get equipment for free, to get people to work for free. If you, you will be so surprised to find how many people will rally behind you if you have a vision and you have a story that people are excited to tell. Go to every film festival you possibly can get to. Go, you know, hang out with as many community filmmakers as possible because that's where you're gonna find the people that you work with. 
and be inspired by other filmmakers. Like one of the most inspiring films I ever saw was when I went to Sundance like maybe 25 years ago. <clears throat> and this guy was at, I think it was like at University of Texas or something for a, as an engineer and then dropped out and went to Kodak at the time they were making film. And he, he got someone who worked at Kodak to give him short ends, which was the end of the film strips. And he made a time travel movie. I wish I remember the name of it because it was so well done. And the the crew in the in the credits is like five people over and over and over again. It was his parents and some friends and his girlfriend. And he made a feature film about time travel on short ends. And when I saw that movie, I was like, this is what it's about. It's about being innovative. It's about having a unique perspective of a voice that nobody's heard before. And it's about doing everything that you can do to tell that story. And that's the best way in. in. It's the best way in. And then, you know, on the other side, everyone I talk to, like at the highest level in, you know, in the Hollywood system, started as assistants. Uh, you go to you go to to LA right now and talk to anybody. Most people who are executives and the gatekeepers and making decisions are like, oh yeah, no, I started as a, an assistant like 20 years ago. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with starting from scratch. There's nothing wrong with it. And you know, finding your voice, finding your people, creating your community, and and just making shit all the time. The more you know about making films, like the more you know, the more you can do, the more power you have. Like if you can be a Robert Rodriguez and shoot and edit and music and like do all of that, like you're lucky. Otherwise you just find people to do that with you. Oh, it's so much fun. Um, before we watch the Little Bird trailer, I'm gonna hand the mic to my teaching colleague, Marina Lear. Hi, Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us. I'm a, oh, can you see me? Oh, I can't. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm a teaching assistant for this class. And I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, you know, with all your experience, um, okay. uh, my question is, uh, particularly as regards supporting indigenous filmmaking, um, what does the U.S. film industry have to learn from the Canadian uh, system? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, I have spoken to, I think you guys are watching Reservation Dogs or have talked about it, so you might know who Sterling Harjo is, but I've known Sterling for like, you know, over 20 years and Taika for that matter. I mean, we all kind of started at the same time and there were many, many years where they would look at us and be like, you guys are so lucky, you know, you have funding, you have all these things and whatever. And, you know, to a certain degree, that is true. However, what we don't have, and when I, you know, when I'm talking about this same thing with him now, it's like, they, have a different kind of reality that we don't have up here, which is like they can get indigenous talent can can get into the studio system in a way that we're not able to up here. So what can they learn? I mean, ultimately, I think that spaces have to be created for indigenous storytellers, and I'll say why, because. You know, if you're studying cinema, you for sure have studied Westerns in the beginning, like the beginning of cinema, John Ford, like I was in this class in, in, at my university um, and studied film and theory and, you know, recognized at a very early age that cinema essentially was a vehicle of propaganda against an indigenous people. So why spaces have to be made intentionally is because we're undoing a lot of years of propaganda against indigenous people. Um, so what they can learn is, I guess, the importance of creating space as a mechanism of systemic change. And because it doesn't happen unless you create that space. Whereas in Canada, we're learning that a little bit more but I think now we're kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe with the states in terms of like 
everybody knows what has to be done and people are sort of waking up to the fact that yeah great like reservation dogs amazing it's amazing that sterling is you know in in these spaces and that tasba and different directors are like making it but there can't just be reservation dogs like in a in a place like the u.s where there's like so much content being made reservation dogs is the one indigenous made show whereas in canada we have my series little bird right now there's another show called Bones with Crows on another network. There's another show, another comedy series called Acting Good. So there's like three, which is still shitty, part of my language, three fully indigenous run and owned and stories, shows. So lots to learn, but I think we're kind of getting there. Oh, and I hope that we're getting to a place where students studio exec exec executives, distribution companies can't just like openly say like change the lead to a white character. It seems so like unbelievable in like even 2013 that somebody can say that to you um, and just get away with it as like part of, part of the business. I mean, we're in a more like, I guess in a, in a place at a university, right? Where we're, we try to go out of our way to, to acknowledge uh, those kind of things, although they probably still happen here as well. Uh, so let's let's uh, shift gears a little bit, and I know you've probably seen the, the trailer for Little Bird more times than you need to recently, but uh, it's pretty short. It's about two minutes. You can play this, and then uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about like developing a brand new show. Um, I think I can say it's okay to say that you have a, a deal with Apple Plus Canada. Um, if you want to say more than that, uh, that would be great. Right, no, we're actually on Crave, we're on Crave TV. Crave TV, okay. Canada, yeah, that's our, that's one of our bigger streamers. But I think what happens is, like, it's on Apple, it's on Apple as, as a, as a shit, like, it's on the Apple page, I don't know why. I think that's, that's where I saw it when I it. Maybe you know something, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even 
I mean, the, the, the professor of architecture at the University College London. What is a building? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, now everybody knows I've been watching Kunk in Britain. Uh, uh, show on Netflix, kind of a mockumentary thing. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that, Jennifer. Um, so tell us a, a, a little bit about, in the time that we, we have remaining, a little bit about Little Bird, um, maybe some brief background about the story and how you've been able to develop a, a show like this. Well, it's a very long story. But uh, just to encapsulate, the story is about, um, it takes place during what we refer to up here as the 60s scoop. It did happen also in the States and still happening. I don't know if you know about the Indian Child Welfare Act that is currently on the brink of being dismantled by the government down there. Um, but essentially, for 200 years, Indigenous children have been removed from their families forcibly by authorities. and. You know, the goal of that is to dismantle families and communities so that, you know, the entire indigenous reality is, is dismantled and fractured to the point of no return. So by removing children, you're able to more effectively, you know, dismantle a whole community. So this particular time was called the 60s Scoop when it was an actual program that um, happened after our residential school system, which is your boarding school system where kids were removed, you know, to go to school. It was mostly children's prisons and often never came home. So this story tracks one woman's story about being removed from her family and raised in a Jewish home in Montreal. Um, there were 30 kids who were adopted through this specific program and raised in Jewish families in Montreal. And I was, um, I was interested in this story originally when it was pitched to me because um, my dad is Jewish and my mom is native. And that's been my sort of intersection of lived experience. So I developed it with, uh, with the producers. I'm a showrunner on this, so I created it and, you know, I, I show ran. So I don't own it, but um, I made it over seven years with um, my partner Hannah Moscovich, and yeah, it's it's now just is just dropped in Canada to, you know, I would say critical acclaim. It's the first premium drama series for our streamer Crave, and it's the first Indigenous series like that that's ever been made here. So I'm really happy to be a part of it, and it's it's a devastating but hopeful uh, journey of you know returning home and reconciling your past and coming to terms with very the very dark reality of colonial violence well uh, that's we, a short, that's, short uh, yeah that's uh, there's there's so much to say and so much to explore right we're, we're actually where our classroom is is quite close to the Native American longhouse on campus I think uh, we would all encourage you to take at least one course in the Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies program while you're a student here. Um, you know, there's only so much we can do in a short half hour conversation, but we are, are so deeply grateful to you for giving us your time. To Emily, who doesn't like to be on camera for introducing us Hi, to Emily. you. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're super excited to check out Crave. All of these folks need to go see Dance Me Outside, uh, and a bunch of your, your other work, uh, and your sister's work as well. I wore a shirt that I stole from my younger brother, because uh, I know that you're, you work with your siblings a lot too. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time. Let's give her a big, 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 big.